From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. The first session of the 67th Idaho Legislature enters its ninth week tomorrow. It started Monday, January 9th with Governor Brad Little's State of the State address. He laid out his legislative and budget priorities. Education is once again his top priority, including providing $8,500 grants to qualifying Idaho high school seniors to go on to higher education. At a recent Idaho Press Club event, the governor said his priorities, uh, his priorities of increasing teacher pay and property tax relief have not been addressed. He said the budget writing committee is likely to take up education funding bills at the end of the session. The legislature's goal is to adjourn on March 24th, so they have a lot of work to do. As of Wednesday, March 1st, only 15 bills had come across his desk and he has signed 11 of them. So far, the legislature has focused a lot on social issues. Those include a bill to penalize abortion sanctuary cities and another that would criminalize doctors who perform gender affirming care. The House also passed a resolution to allow for talks to begin with the Oregon legislature about the potential for greater Idaho by moving the Idaho state line to include some conservative eastern Oregon counties. The governor also said the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee got off to a slow start working on budgets, but they seem to be catching up. We have a lot to talk about today as we focus on what the legislature has done so far and what they still have to do. My guests are Boise State University political science professor Dr. Jacqueline Kettler and KTVB reporter Andrew Bartline, who has been covering the legislature very closely this legislative session. Thanks to both of you for being here today. Happy to be here. All right, Dr. Kettler, first of all, for you, what's your big takeaway of from what's happened in these first eight weeks? Well, it's been a fascinating session so far, and we knew that it was going to be interesting, right? Because so much turnover coming in, so many new legislators, new leaders, a lot of new committee chairs. So a lot of interest in what issues would be the top priorities. It seems like some things have been moving a little slow as they've kind of figured some things out, but we have had so much attention on some of these social issues in particular. So I think there's a lot of other issues to still get to in a very short amount of time. So it may be kind of a fast and furious next few weeks. It seems like it's heading in that direction. How about for you, Andrew? You've been down there so many days this session. Yeah, and I would echo a lot of what she said to where it does feel slow at times, um, but in another note, you know, trying to say for my analyst hat, just having a reporter hat on, Doug, um, you're not questioning a lot of things in terms of where people stand. I think it's been very straightforward, which I appreciate as a reporter. When you talk to lawmakers about this bill or that bill and what their priorities are, it's been very straightforward. There hasn't been a lot of guessing or straw man arguments, and, and that's something that I've appreciated a lot. But again, I would like to echo Dr. Kettler that it does feel a little bit slow considering that market March 24th date and then what we've seen actually happen up until this point so far. And what did the governor say about the pace the other day at the uh, press club event? I don't know if he talked about the pace specifically, but he did say that there are these priorities that we know from the Boise State Public Policy Survey, and I know you're going to touch on that later, but we haven't exactly seen those addressed so far. So what, we're two months into the session, those top priorities haven't really seen those touched on. So you can kind of connect those two points yourself and see what you might think that pace yeah, would be. Yeah, you're talking about education, the jobs economy, mm -hmm. property tax relief. I know there's a lot going on with that too that we'll touch on as well. Um, Dr. Kettler, so far, what do you think has slowed down the first half of the session is it you know, JFAC, different procedures, and these other policy debates? Yeah, I think there's a few things. One in particular, Joint Finance Appropriations Committee has reworked their voting protocol, and it took a while for leaders to decide how that was going to operate, right? So they've changed it to where now they do separate the votes for the House and the Senate members of the committee. And so it took a while to kind of figure that out, and I believe it slowed down some of their work on things like um, supplemental budgets and some of those types of things. We, you also had, and I I think if you go back to last year's primary election, some of those candidates that defeated incumbents came in with really key goals on some of these social issues, and they came in really wanting to work on it. And so we've had a lot of attention on some, and, and, a, and a lot of time spent on some of these social issues that have really kind of eaten up a good amount of time. And I believe it's 40 brand new legislators yeah. <laughs> who had never served in the House or Senate before. And so there's a lot of ideas 
out there. And, and you know, sometimes it takes the freshman some time to learn the system, but you haven't seen that? Well, I know, I think that has happened as well, right? It takes a little bit of time to understand the process, how, how it works. I think the leadership has, has done a nice job of trying to ensure that things are still operating on the floor, right, as needed, but it does take time for people just to learn how the process works, how to engage, how a committee hearing works, all those types of things. So there's a lot of learning on the job in those first few weeks that happened as well. And how about with all the new leadership? I know like Speaker of the House Moyle was majority leader for so long, so he kind of slid right in there and, and took over, but other people are in different positions. Sure, and a lot of new committee chairs as well, which can really affect what the what bills are going to be heard and proceed out of those committees as well, right? And so I think that's where it's been really interesting to watch a lot of these new committee chairs and how that's affected the operations of some of these committees. For example, things like the Senate Education Committee has been a really fascinating one to watch this session so far. And it will be as we get yeah, further into true. actually getting to the budget process. And Andrew, the governor did talk about some of the issues um, that, you know, not being an issue in Idaho in the sense that he said, I believe, um, it's like we're building a moat around Idaho. Yeah, that's what he touched on exactly when he was at that breakfast with the press and talking to him. And I think that question came up because of a question from Boise State Public Radio saying, look, we have this public policy survey about education, the economy, housing, health care, taxes. These are like the top five priorities that people want touched on. Why are we looking at legislation that is focused more on social issues? And the governor said that even in himself, when he was a state lawmaker, that sometimes you pass laws to solve problems that don't exist in the state. The governor admitted that at the breakfast mm -hmm. and he says we do it to make a statement. Now, there was some pushback on the governor from other reporters in the room. Well, what about this legislation? What about that legislation? What statement are you trying to send exactly? Or what statement is the state legislature trying to send? He didn't exactly answer that question directly, but he did say there are laws that solve problems that don't exist in Idaho, and we do it to make a statement. Interesting, and like basically to keep issues out that have a potential of coming in as they have been in, in other states. Right. So, um, Andrew, we, we, we've talked a lot about education, but not in the terms of the budget yet. Um, there's been a vote on the, uh, the Idaho launch grants that was very tight, but also we've heard a lot about education savings accounts. Mm -hmm. A bill did get shot down this past week, um, but are you expecting to see more versions of an education savings account, in other words, using public tax money for uh, private education. I'm almost positive we'll actually see one here shortly. I mean, the reason for that is Senator Tammy Nichols' bill, uh, that ESA bill, uh, we heard, talked to a lot of people about that, people in the conservative think tank world, I think Intermountain Policy Center, if I'm getting that name right. They even said they're not positive this is the bill going forward, but it's a starting point to begin that conversation. And there's some questions in that bill about the specific language, people wanting to push amendments forth on that language, things about accountability to dollars if they do go to private schools and things of that nature. Um, I think Jaron Crane, Representative Jaron Crane, has a bill that he's trying to push forth, and we're trying to talk to him about that as well. So if Senator Tammy Nichols' bill is the only one, I would be very surprised. I imagine, Dr. Kettler, you feel the same way. Yeah, and this is an issue that we've seen really become a big issue in other states as well. So it's not just Idaho that's that have that's considering different options for the education savings accounts. And uh, I think that it's really interesting like in some other areas as well to watch the debates in Idaho and then see similar debates happening in other states. And um, we've been talking about the social issues. We've seen a, quite a bit of discussion about like transgender issues, um, criminalizing doctors for, uh, you know, gender affirming uh, surgeries or procedures, also, you know, bathroom discussion, who can use which bathroom based on how they identify. Any surprises that those are, have become big talking points? I, I, not really, for a few reasons. Some of these were discussed and debated last session. We we're also seeing proposals very similar to some of these in a lot of other states, particularly on the banning gender affirming care for transgender youth has been passed in quite a few states now and other states in the region are, are considering it. Additionally, these are kind of national issues that have re received a lot of attention, right? Whether or not it's the top priority for a lot of Idahoans, I think is a question, but we are seeing a lot of discussion kind of nationally about these, these topics as well. And are you hearing that more bills along these lines are coming up too? Or are they working on stuff that's specifically um, already been put forth? Uh, it's tough to understand exactly what's going on because you talk to a lot of the lawmakers about, you know, you finish an interview with them about a certain topic. Well, what else are you working on? What are you hearing? A lot of them say, well, you'll have to wait and see. So <laughs> it's, it's tough to say, Doug, but I would imagine so. Bill's in the works. All right. The Senate also passed a resolution 
to ask voters in a, in a near future election if basically if they would like to amend the Constitution to make it more difficult to uh, put forth, uh, put voter initiatives on the ballot. And Andrew, where does that stand now? So I think that's a Senate resolution, yes, yes. and it did pass the Senate, to my understanding, very recently. Mm -hmm. I think it was the end of last month, um, or maybe the very beginning of this month. What is it? Beginning <laughs> Just a of few March. Days ago, yeah. Yeah, right? It's <laughs> tough to say. Everything's blended together at this point, weeks into the session. Um, so that would go into a House committee, I believe it'd be state affairs, so it'd be very similar to a bill. It would go into the mm -hmm. House side, so um, that would change a lot of things, and there's people for and against it on both sides, but uh, yeah, that bill made it through the Senate. It would go over to the House and have the same process over again. And uh, Joe Paris, chief political reporter for us, also reported that the governor does not have to sign that one, so if the House and the Senate both pass this resolution, essentially that vote that question would go on the ballot I think in November of 2024 Correct. for voters to decide and this and Jackie this uh, right now I guess it's required that you get six percent of voter signatures in 18 legislative districts and what they're asking is if people would like that to be six percent in all 35 correct correct and and the legislature tried to pass this previously but the idaho supreme court struck it down as unconstitutional and so this is now we have this constitutional amendment proposal to send it to the voters to decide whether or not to expand this requirement to 35 districts with the idea that this ensures that the entire state would be represented and that not only one region could like force a ballot initiative onto the ballot. Could this be more popular in say the rural areas that don't have um, a, a, the larger population? Well, that's been some of the arguments that legislators have used and I think it'd be really interesting to see how voters do respond to it because the alternative, the alternative is if rural areas wanted to pass a ballot initiative and the urban areas said no, this will also harm them in that process. So like I think it really kind of depends on what perspective you take on it and I'll be fascinated to see if it gets to the ballot how voters will respond to it. And I think it will also be interesting to see that if it does make it that far, the educational efforts mm -hmm. that go on from both sides. For sure. Got to figure out and, you know, try to sway the voters to their position. Well, we're going to take a short break right now and coming up on Viewpoint, what's still to come in the 2023 legislative session. We'll be right back. It's the 36 hour sale at Furniture Row. So get ready because everything is on sale. Like this unbeatable deal on the Blake upholstered bed, only $3.99. Save big on the Cascade sofa in denim or taupe for only $4.99. Get the five piece counter height dogwood dining set for only $5.49. And check out the queen size summit firm, easy on the wallet for only $2.99.99. Plus four years, no interest financing. But don't wait, the 36 hour sale at Furniture Row ends Monday the 6th. Has your cable TV lost its spark? Do you suffer from the buffer? You deserve reliable TV without the hassle and the frustration. A-Plus Satellite is your premier local dish retailer, serving the Treasure Valley with reliable TV and real customer service for over 15 years. If you have Sparklight TV, switching to dish with A-Plus Satellite could save you over $700 a year. Stop in for a face-to-face -face with A-Plus Satellite at Fairview and Eagle, behind Krispy Kreme. At California Closets, every project is personalized, custom designed, and installed by true craftsmen. That's the California Closets difference. We call it practical magic. Get started with a free design consultation. Attention cancer victims who use the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. If you or someone you love used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, call the number on your screen now. Don't wait. There may be time deadlines to file a claim. Call 800-505-9892. That's 800-505-9892. It's time for a new shower, but you don't want the hassle. You just want it done. Rebath, from start to stunning. Call us or visit Rebath.com and save $1,250 off your complete bathroom remodel. Welcome back to Viewpoint. Lawmakers are heading into week nine of the 2023 legislative session tomorrow. Today, we've recapped some of the bills and issues the legislature has taken up so far. Now we're going to switch the focus to what's likely to come in this session. Once again, my guests are Boise State University political science professor Dr. Jacqueline Kettler and KTVB reporter Andrew Bartline, who's been covering the legislature very closely for us this year. And Andrew, we mentioned the Boise State University um, School of Public Policy survey that they do every year asking people what they want the legislature to focus on. What did that find 
um, this year. It's pretty comparable to what we've seen in the priorities from the governor and his state of the state address, actually, and I imagine they probably played off each other because top to bottom it goes education, economy, and jobs. Those are in tandem at two. Housing, health care, and then taxes. Later on in that survey, it really leads you to believe it's more so about tax relief specifically for that five spot, Doug. And uh, Dr. Kettler, why haven't we seen much action on those yet? I know we've talked a lot about the social issues. Are there other reasons too? Well, I think, I mean, sometimes it just takes a little while to pull some of these proposals together. Um, you know, trying to decide, you know, what are we going to focus on? What might be proposals look like? For example, on the property taxes, we have several proposals that bills that have been introduced, but haven't really gotten much attention on those quite of, quite of yet. So I think the question is kind of when do we when do we see more movement into focusing on some of those issues? Maybe they're trying to get through some of these other kind of more controversial ones first or things like that. It's it's kind of an interesting question, but we still we do have some of these proposals trying to address some of these mm -hmm. topics issues. Yeah, and, and Andrew, you just talked with Speaker Moyle about what they've seen so far. So uh, I think as you reported it, it was there, nothing has happened on property tax relief, but not for lack of trying. Yeah, and it's tough because there's three bills specifically in the House right now, 77, 78, 79. And the reason they're all in a line like that is because they were introduced in committee on the same exact day. And I believe Monks, who chairs that committee, did that specifically on purpose. Um, but the difficulty has been people coming to an agreement on it. I think Moyle's perspective is he wants to pay off school levies and bonds to ideally give tax relief to everybody in these areas that you know pay into those levies and bonds all property meanwhile some of the other bills are focused on homeowners exemption people who live in their primary home that they own well Moyle says that plays favorites so the speaker kind of having a disagreement with some of the bills in the house but then you look over in the senate uh, senator grow he has bills of his own that look to do something similar paying off um, what would be property tax bills through uh, state income dollars. Okay. And again, Moyle says that bill narrows down winners and losers and helps people who very specific demographic, not all property owners. So that's kind of been the disagreement why nothing seems to really be moving out of committee right now, according to Speaker Moyle. Last uh, September, I believe it was, the uh, legislature had a special session to talk about what to do with the $1.6 billion budget surplus. A lot of that went to tax relief and tax rebates. Um, also, though, a huge chunk went to education, $410 million um, and $120 million for property tax relief. So the governor has said that property tax relief is also uh, a big priority for him. For sure, and this is, I mean, it's definitely always better to have a budget surplus than a deficit. Sure. But, but you do get into these arguments about, well, how do we spend this money and what is the best way and what's the most kind of fair way, equal way, or, or all those types of questions. And here, we're seeing some real intense debates as well about that education funding. And for example, the Idaho launch grants, that really close vote in the House on, on that proposal. So that go, how that will be handled in the Senate will be interesting to see. What was it 36, 34, I think? I think that's if, right. If my math that's correct is that <laughs> <laughs> anyway um so the uh, education stuff and you know the governor is really pushing that it's been his top priority since even before he ran and the 330 million dollars he wants to see something happen with teacher pay and we haven't heard anything about that yet either so do you think there's going to be a big fight when the education budget is starts being hashed out? I think we're going to see some probably pretty intense budget budget fights coming up in coming weeks and I think some of those education topics will be exactly those and we're already starting to see it happen some um, and for example in the Senate Education Committee some debates about the the facility money for facil school facilities so I think that what we could see some really you know, interesting and, and potentially ten contentious debates about education funding. And Andrew, you reported uh, last week that uh, the goal for lawmakers is to adjourn by March 24th. So that basically gives them three weeks. They've been in for eight. Um, from what those you've been talking to in leadership and others, do they think that's possible? I mean, perhaps. I mean, it's tough to say you'd really have to sprint toward a finish line. I'm not sure how often the state legislature has laid out a date ahead of time and hit that date. I think it's always easier to get closer to date, the yeah. If you can move your deadline, you're probably going to move your deadline, right? Yeah. I just think about myself personally. So I think it's more realistic it doesn't happen. But I mean, I guess it's possible. Again, these priorities that people say they want, well, it needs to be addressed. And there's a short amount of time to do that. Can they do it before the 24th? Uh, we'll have to see. And if 
it's not, they'll probably extend it. Yeah, and, and Jackie, in your experience, how, how is this unusual to have this much work to do at this point in the session? It's very common, and this, this is just kind of how leg state legislatures operate, right? You kind of start out slow, to having a lot of discussion about proposals, and then you, then you get a lot of bill bills being introduced, and then at the end of the session, there's near the end, there's just a ton of activity that happens. So it's, it's not uncommon to see this, but it does seem, it, it is interesting to see so many big priorities for Idahoans still yet to be addressed in the session. It's not an election year. Right. And we know that on election years, they do like to try to stick to that target date so they can campaign for the primaries and whatnot. Um, do you see that being, uh, you know, will allow for, you know, hey, well, if we need to stay two, three, four extra weeks to get these things done that they'll do it? I think that's right. They don't have that external pressure of like, I want to go to my district, I want to be campaigning, I'll be talking to voters. So there is a little bit more flexibility. However, some of them do want to get back to their jobs and things like that, right? Families, all those types of things. So uh, I think for some legislators, there is a little bit more incentive to wrap up and for others, um, they're, they're more, they're okay staying longer and, and really diving into these issues. Yeah, we do have to keep in mind that they are part-time. Yeah legislators. Dr. Jacqueline Kettler with Boise State University, thank you so much for your time, for your analysis today, and Andrew, of course, all of your reporting that you've been doing at the State House this year, and you'll probably be back down there <laughs> on Monday getting ready for week nine. We'll see. All right, Andrew, thank you so much, both of you. Well, coming up next on Viewpoint, Idaho has a state bird, the mountain bluebird, a state flower, the syringa, and a state vegetable, of course, the potato. But we don't have a state dinosaur, at least not yet. A movement is underfoot, fueled by a fourth grade class to make the digging runner our prehistoric symbol. I can't pronounce what digging runner translates to for the dinosaur's actual name, so we'll find out about that next. Gas prices are on everyone's mind right now, and you're going to want a vehicle that is first in class when it comes to fuel economy. Tune in to Idaho Today, Tuesday, to learn about the all-new Nissan Rogue. Do you listen to the TV on high volume or have trouble hearing conversations? Then you would benefit from hearing aids. Don't waste thousands on expensive hearing aids when you can get Nano's revolutionary technology for just $297. Don't be fooled by higher priced hearing aids. The CIC Recharge is a true hearing aid, not an amplifier. With rechargeable technology many customers say is superior to more expensive models. Call now and get not one, but two Nano hearing aids for just $297. $97. Plus, we'll add a portable charging case and ship your order absolutely free. The CIC Recharge has a tiny in-the-ear canal design that is nearly invisible. Why keep missing out on important conversations or waste thousands of dollars? Call and get two CIC Recharge hearing aids for only $297 and free shipping. 800-852-0091. Again, that's 800-852-0091. We are CHF Home Furnishings. CHF has been building trust while delivering kitchen and laundry appliances to homes like yours for 69 years. From washers and dryers to fridges, dishwashers, and stoves. Come see why CHF is ranked 15th in the nation. Fourth grade is when you learn about Idaho, the geography, the history, the cultures, the state symbols. It's one of the best parts of Mr. Walton's fourth grade class at Yukon Elementary in Eastern Idaho. But last year it got a little more exciting. That's when he and a student named Calvin, who was totally into dinosaurs, came to the conclusion that Idaho deserves its own designated dinosaur. So they put together a professional packet of pleas, drawings, and essays asking for the latest in a line of gem state symbols, a state dinosaur. It didn't get any footing at last legislative session, but this year, a different story. As Brian Holmes shows us, a creature from the Cretaceous period could be part of fourth grade studies for future Idaho students. 
Good morning and welcome. Maybe you Senate missed State it during Monday's signed Senate State Office Affairs Senate. Committee hearing. I am testifying in opposition to Bill 1056. Mixed in the middle of militias. Next, uh, RS-30461, I think. Um, and filings on foster care. Our current statute requires a Senator Kevin Cook. And I'm here to introduce a bill. Slipped in one of this session's most important bills. It uh, represents some of our most valued individuals in the state of Idaho, and that is a bunch of fourth graders. Fourth graders yeah. who lobbied legislators and wrote letters. In their very, very best handwriting, and their very best English, they stated why the state of Idaho needed a state dinosaur. That dinosaur? Arictodromius. Arictodromius. Arictodromius, yeah. Okay. Was nominated by Mr. Walton's fourth grade class. I think mostly just because it sounded fun. At UConn oh, Elementary. I think we just first started saying, hey, dinosaurs are awesome. Only 24 states have even found dinosaurs. Why couldn't we suggest a dinosaur for a state symbol? And we just thought, well, if we're going to suggest a dinosaur as a state symbol, we ought to find out which one the paleontologists in the state know about. Have we found <laughs> dinosaurs here? A good question to ask of someone who's dug dinosaurs since he was a kid. Yeah, I have never grown out of it, so. Dr. L.J. Krumenacher is a paleontologist at Idaho State University and grew up in Blackfoot. When I started as a kid, they said Idaho didn't have dinosaurs. And I was like, well, maybe if I look really hard, <laughs> we can find some. And you did. Yeah, it kind of made me happy. Dr. Krumenacher was one of the first to find the Arictodromius in the gem state about 20 years ago, a 95 million year old burrowing herbivore. Yeah, about the size of a dog, 11 feet long. Whose name translates to digging runner. The seven feet of that would have been tail. So he's just a little long tailed dog sized dinosaur. There've been about 15 full skeletons found in Idaho, a rare find for any fossil. So my best hypothesis this is part of what I did for my PhD is that these animals are basically digging their own graves since they're burrowing. It's easier to preserve a fossil if it buries itself, basically is the way I look at it. And they were sometimes found in groups with either their offspring or other adults. Which in of itself is pretty rare evidence for a dinosaur, something else to make this special. So you can see why. It's Idaho's dinosaur. We only find them here. Mr. Walton's fourth graders feel the Arictodromius should be our next state symbol. I think it would be absolutely fascinating if students here at UConn Elementary School into the future could say, we were part of that, we helped that happen, and uh, just celebrate this new state symbol. I know, it, it would just be absolutely thrilling. Arictodromius, got it. Now, after the motion was seconded by the self-proclaimed oldest dinosaur on the committee, Senate Bill 1127 was printed and awaits a full hearing in the Senate State Affairs Committee. Dr. Krumenacher says it's about time Idaho had a state dinosaur. Only 14 others do, and it's a great way to get kids excited about science. And as Mr. Walton found out, it's also a great way to teach kids about civics, both of which Senator Cook said are a great example of what our public schools are doing for our kids. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here next Sunday morning.